History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 117th episode of the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And on this episode, we're going to be featuring Grove Park Inn, which is in Asheville, North Carolina. We've been spending a lot of time in North Carolina, which is a good thing since we're going to be taking a trip up there, Denise. This is another location we can go check out for ourselves. I'm super excited because I've been mapping out our entire Carolina trip recently, so that's great. This was suggested to us by our listener, Gina Gwynn, and I hope I said your last name right. And we had research assistance from Stephen Pappas. Before we tell you about that, we do want to point you in the direction of our website, historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us some feedback, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. We did get an email from Dean Carrington. He said, I've recently discovered your podcast. I love it. You both do such a great job. I'm listening to several episodes each day trying to catch up. I love history and find the paranormal very intriguing. You cover both topics in a wonderful manner. I just listened to the Ghosts in the Bible episode, and boy, did you two cover that subject well. Keep up the good job. We really enjoyed doing that episode. That was a lot of fun. We should think of a way to do a part two. That was, I just really enjoyed doing that. And then we also heard from Michelle DePriest and the Spooktacular crew on the USS Lexington episode. Hi, Spook crew. I just wanted to add something about the Lexington podcast. I know someone posted about replenishing supplies while at sea, and I don't know for sure about during the time of the Lexington voyages, but my husband was a submariner from 1998 to 07 or something like that, and they also had powdered milk. So, Denise, does that mean that there were powdered cows on board to make that powdered milk? (laughs) Of course not. Like I told you before, that would be plain silly. (laughs) These would be special cows that actually had powdered milk because they were a little bit dehydrated. Oh, okay. We want to send a shout out on Twitter to PC Prosperi and Mama Natrix. Thanks so much. She heard about us from Bizarre States. Also want to give a shout out to the Nighttime Podcast. This comes out of Canada. And uh, we were going back and forth on Twitter. He has a little three-year-old son, Denise, and apparently he's seeing a ghost in their house. And he played a little clip of his son talking about the ghost. And it just reminded me of our nephew, Jacob, who saw the old man ghost in the neighbor's house next door back Uh, in Colorado. uh So interesting, these little three-year-olds seeing these things. And the way he described the ghost to his dad, he said he's just sitting there, but he doesn't have a face. Yeah, three-year-olds don't make that stuff up. No. Congrats to Terry Surprenant, the winner of our t-shirt drawing for the month of March. So, of course, one more of our t-shirts with the exclusive 2016 design is being shipped out. Yeah, very cool. And we sent out a couple of logo mugs to some of our executive producers. We've been sending out a lot of rewards lately. That's cool. I like giving things away. We want to welcome to the Spooktacular crew, Her. Hey, Her. Dean. Hi, Dean. Megan. Hey, Megan. And Candace. Hello, Candace. And I'm looking forward to our trip coming up this next weekend. We are going to be in Denver, Colorado. We are planning on doing two meetups, not just one. We're doing a pub crawl on Friday evening at 8.30 p.m. It's almost full. So if you wanted to do that with us, uh, sign up quick. Yeah. There's like six spots left. What is the website for that? It's um, nightlyspirits.com, I believe. Nightlyspirits.com. Make sure you're on the Denver tours because I think they're in multiple states. And uh, it's the pub crawl on the 15th of April tax day at 8.30 p.m. So we'd love to have you join us for that. And then we are trying to set up a Capitol Hill haunted walking tour on Sunday. We're not sure of the time yet because we're trying to get together with the tour director and set up some kind of a private thing. And again, just to verify, that is the Capitol Hill in Denver. We'll still be in Denver. If you want to do that, let us know. So email us at historyghostbump at gmail.com because I don't think there's any other way for you to register for that. So let us know. We're really looking forward to meeting. We already know we're going to meet a couple of our listeners, so that'll be fun. Yes, a couple of listeners, and we're going to have some family who are also listeners join us. Denise, are you ready to hit Grove Park Inn? I absolutely am. All right, let's go. All right. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. 
For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime bonus cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to This Moment in Oddity. This Moment in Oddity is by Bob Sherfield. Many people may be surprised to find that, after the Grand Canyon, one of the most popular visitor attractions in Arizona is a structure that started its life several thousand miles away in London. How did London Bridge end up in Lake Havasu City? Was it an error on the part of the buyer, as urban legend sometimes claims? Or was it a clever way of selling a structure no longer fit for its purpose? This isn't the bridge which caught fire in 1212, killing a reported 3,000 people, nor the medieval bridge on which the severed and tarred heads of executed traitors were displayed, and certainly not the bridge immortalized in the children's nursery rhyme. This bridge dates from 1831 and had come up for sale due to the fact that it had become unable to cope with the traffic demands of 1960s London. Subsidence problems were causing one side of the bridge to sink at a rate of an inch every eight years, and by 1967 it was nearly unusable. So the City of London decided to put it on the market. Robert P. McCulloch, a Missouri-born oil and aviation entrepreneur and chainsaw tycoon, purchased the bridge for $2.5 million and then spent another $7 million dismantling and transporting it to the U.S. McCulloch had two reasons for purchasing the bridge. He had founded Lake Havasu City, a planned retirement community, in 1964 and wanted it to link to an island on the Colorado River, attracting buyers as well as acting as a tourist draw for his new development. By October 1971, the bridge had been reconstructed and a lavish opening party took place with a gala dinner held in a tent 40 feet high, weighing nearly 20 tons. Its walls were decorated with pendants, coats of arms, shields, and the entrance was lined with suits of armor. The bridge's relocation inspired a 1985 made-for-TV movie, Bridge Across Time, starring David Hasselhoff, in which the spirit of Jack the Ripper is transported to the U.S. in the stones of the bridge. So had McCulloch been aware he was purchasing Tower Bridge? Probably not, but the fact that London Bridge now spans the Colorado River certainly is odd. You're not afraid of a little ghost, are you? This Day in History And This Day in History is brought to us by Kristen Swinkeck. On this day, April 9th, in 1865... Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant, ending the Civil War. In early 1864, President Lincoln made Grant the commander of all Union armies. Grant made his headquarters with the Army of the Potomac and put Major General William Sherman in command of most Western armies. Sherman moved his armies from Chattanooga to Atlanta, defeating Confederate Generals Joseph E. Johnson and John Bell Hood along the way. On September 2, 1864, Atlanta was taken by Union armies, guaranteeing the re-election of Abraham Lincoln as President of the United States. After leaving Atlanta, Sherman reached Savannah, Georgia in December of 1864. His armies were followed by thousands of freed slaves. There were no major battles along this march. After months of increasing pressure on Lee's army, it was thinned by many casualties and desertion. By December, Lee's army was much smaller than Grant's. The Confederates' last attempt to break the Union's hold was at the Battle of Five Forks, also known as the Waterloo of the Confederacy, on April 1st, and they failed. The Confederate capital fell to the Union 25th Corps, which was made up completely of black troops. With their capital now lost, Lee evacuated his army. Lee did not originally intend to surrender, but had planned to regroup at the Appomattox Courthouse to gather supplies and continue the fighting. Grant chased Lee got in front of him, and Lee's army was surrounded upon reaching the courthouse. 
Realizing the fight was hopeless, Lee surrendered at the McLean House in Appomattox, Virginia. As a sign of respect, with the hope of restoring peace, Grant made an untraditional gesture, allowing Lee to keep his sword and horse. This surrender came five days before President Lincoln is shot in the Ford Theater by John Wilkes Booth on April 14th. The president died the next day and was succeeded by Andrew Johnson. President Johnson officially declared an end to the insurrection on May 9th of 1865. You're listening to History Goes Bump. Grove Park Inn in Asheville, North Carolina is one of the most uniquely designed hotels in America and it fits its setting in the mountains of North Carolina perfectly. Those mountains have a number of claims to fame. People come from all around to see the leaves change colors in the fall, to take part in winter sports such as skiing and snowboarding, and to hike its dozens of trails on the beautiful Blue Ridge Parkway. Nestled in the mountains lies the city of Asheville. This growing city is home to over a dozen craft and major breweries, the University of North Carolina at Asheville, and the Biltmore Estate, which you may recall we previously covered on podcast episode 81. Just down the road from the estate sits the historic Grove Park Inn, which faces Sunset Mountain. The guest list includes the rich and famous and many presidents, but it's one guest in particular who has endured through all the decades. She is a mysterious woman in pink who has a penchant for appearing out of nowhere and disappearing just as quickly. And she brings an icy chill with her. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Grove Park Inn. Denise, you know one of the best things about doing ghost tours and checking out haunted history? Is finding ladies in various colors (laughs) and they're not wearing white? (laughs) No, it is interesting. We do have a pink lady tonight. When I originally would think about going to North Carolina, it didn't sound like an exciting state to me. Nothing against you North Carolinians, but it just didn't sound like an exciting state to go to. It's like, well, I've heard that they have some really nice beaches, but I was like, I don't know. And now I am dying to go to North Carolina because we've covered so many haunted locations there. But seriously, Diane, as soon as I found out you could buy a bag of dirt and find gems, I was sold on North Carolina. Well, yeah, that's your thing. Before the Europeans arrived in America, the land which Asheville now sits on belonged to the Cherokee Nation. They controlled the majority of the western part of North Carolina until their numbers were greatly diminished by the arrival of Europeans bringing weapons and disease. In 1784, Colonel Samuel Davidson and his family decided to settle in the Swanoa Valley and built a log cabin in the North Carolina mountains. Not long after the completion of their home, Colonel Davidson was lured into the woods by a group of Cherokee hunters and was killed. His wife and child, along with a female slave, fled on foot to a fort 16 miles away to seek refuge. Davidson's twin brother, William, along with Samuel's brother-in-law, formed a group to retrieve the colonel's body and avenge his death. After a campaign in which many Cherokee were killed, they returned to the area with their families and settled the town of Morristown, North Carolina. This would go on to be renamed Asheville in 1797 after the North Carolina governor Samuel Ashe. The Ash family had been very active in politics, and Governor Ash had served in multiple capacities before becoming governor. And here's a little fun fact. Governors in North Carolina at that time served for a one-year term, and they had a term limit of three, which means they could only serve for three full years, Denise. Wow, wouldn't that help probably in <laughs> our, now, our now government seat? I'm pro that for everybody. <laughs> Edwin Wiley Grove was born in 1850 in a small town in the state of Tennessee. He served in the Civil War and then began to chase his dream of working in the pharmaceutical field. He moved to northwest Tennessee to a town named Paris when he was 24. He began working as a clerk in Dr. S.H. Codwell and A.B. Meacham's pharmacy located in the courthouse square in Paris. Grove was a hard worker and motivated, two things that would help him become a leading entrepreneur. Dr. Codwell took notice and brought Grove on as a partner. By 1880, Grove was able to buy the partners out and he put his name on the pharmacy, renaming it Grove's Pharmacy. Grove experimented with different concoctions and he held in the back of his mind the idea that if someone could figure out how to make quinine tasteless, that person would become rich. Quinine is found in the bark of the chinchona tree, which is found mainly in Andean forests in South America. It has medicinal qualities that reduce fevers, swelling, and pain. One of the main diseases that it's used in the treatment of is malaria. 
Malaria is not much of a danger in America anymore, but at one time it was, and quinine was in high demand. In fact, malaria was called the scourge of the South. I had no idea that it was that big in the South that they had a name for it like that. I did not know that either until this research. Generally, when you think of malaria, you think of some jungle in some other country somewhere. Ed Grove started working on a tasteless form of quinine, and he was successful in 1885. He managed to formulate a tonic that suspended quinine and a flavored syrup that needed to be shaken vigorously before taking. He called the formula Grove's Tasteless Chill Tonic. It was not exactly tasteless, but it was far more palatable than other quinine remedies, and it was an immediate success. Based on this, Grove met with a group of investors, and they all formed the Paris Medical Company to produce the chill tonic. By the late 1890s, the tonic was a staple in many houses, and Denise, it sold more bottles than Coca-Cola. That's crazy. That blows my mind. This is a tonic, and it's selling more bottles than Coca-Cola. I know, and then they're buying this tonic when they all should have known that just a spoonful of sugar will help that medicine go down. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Just take the quinine and a spoonful of sugar and you'll be good. Done. And then you can have all the Coca-Cola you want. Denise, the interesting thing about this Groves Chill Tonic is the logo that they use to advertise it. They put a baby's head on a pig's body. And the little saying that went with it makes children and adults as fat as pigs. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm sure not only would that sell today, but the creep factor of the logo is enough to make me run. And this is amazing. On the market over 20 years, one and a half million bottles sold last year. And I don't know when the, where this advertisement, what year that comes from, but one and a half million bottles sold in just one year. And I do encourage our listeners to Google the logo because it's creepy. Like I wouldn't look at it and say, oh, I think I need some of that. It's way creepy. <laughs> I, I don't even know that that's a baby's head. It looks like a fat guy that's been shrunk down. I don't know. It is really creepy. You'll have to check that. Actually, what I will do is I'll put a picture in the show notes. That would work. Grove was now a very wealthy man. He believed the area near Asheville had medicinal benefits and began buying tracts of land and farms. He intended to change the face of the city and demolish some tuberculosis hospitals during this process. He began work building neighborhoods, but then decided that he would like to build a hotel. He partnered with his son-in-law, Fred C. Lee, and the two looked for a suitable architect. Grove didn't find anyone who had a plan he liked. Seeley came to him with a set of plans he had drawn up himself, and Grove was so pleased that he told Seeley that he was in charge of building the hotel. The men chose an area on Sunset Mountain. Seeley promised to have it built in a year. In 1912, construction began on the Grove Park Inn. The hotel has a very unique look because it was built from granite stones. Keep in mind that this is being built on a mountain in the early 1900s, meaning that everything had to be transported by mules, wagons, and ropes. Some of the granite boulders weighed as much as 10,000 pounds. Imagine hoisting that up the mountain. I can't even imagine, even with modern equipment, that would be a feat. Now, of course, a lot of those stones were pulled from right there, but still, you got to transport those things and then get it up on the structure. Yeah, but 10,000 pounds is a lot of pounds. Mm -hmm. 400 men were employed, and they worked 10-hour shifts six days a week. The frame of the building was made from concrete and steel, and then workers formed the walls with the granite stones, building them much like a puzzle, fitting pieces that would go perfectly together. Seeley kept his promise, and the Grove Park Inn officially opened on July 12, 1913. It was a little less than a year later. William Jennings Bryan was the Secretary of State at the time, and he gave a speech at the grand opening. The lobby is known as the Great Hall and measures 120 feet across with 24-foot high ceilings. Two grand granite fireplaces are in the lobby, and they are famous for not only their size, but their unique style. When the hotel first opened, those two fireplaces were the main heating source. And I imagine that's where everybody gathered. I'd be parked in front of those the whole time. Oh, no kidding. Me too. The two Otis elevators have been featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not and are located within the fireplaces. This design was originally meant to hide the noise of the mechanisms. The goal of the inn was relaxation and they tried to dissuade unnecessary noise. So much so that children under 10 were not welcome. My kind of hotel. And th that's actually, I think, one of the standards for a five-star hotel. Ah. Running water after 10 p.m. was discouraged, and if conversations got too loud in the lobby, staff would hand people cards asking them to quiet down. 
love that. Just handing around cards. Shut up. <laughs> Knock it off. <laughs> Don't get any ideas. The roof has five and a half inch thick poured concrete over an elaborate web of twisted steel and red clay tiles were laid over that to give the roof a thatch-like appearance. And this design makes it completely weatherproof. There's also an expansive porch overlooking Sunset Mountain. And that red clay tile roof is very distinctive. So it's part of its unique look. The furniture was mission style, or some people know that as arts and crafts, and designed by the Roy Croft Artisan Community. 600 hammered copper light fixtures were made, as well as 400 oak crafted chairs and an eight foot grandfather clock. Many of these can be seen at the hotel today still. The grandfather clock sits the main entrance and features a hammered copper face. Quotes are inscribed on rocks throughout the Great Hall as inspiration. Over the years, the Grove Park Inn has boasted quite the guest list. The names of those who've stayed at the hotel are too numerous to list them all, but just a few would be Thomas Edison, Harry Houdini, Captain Kirk, or William Shatner, Henry Ford, Helen Keller, William Jennings Bryan, of course, we mentioned him earlier, and 10 U.S. presidents from FDR to Nixon to even our current president, President Obama, and many other famous people. F. Scott Fitzgerald stayed in the hotel for two years as he wrote, and apparently his wife was staying in an asylum nearby, so it worked out perfectly for him so that he could go visit her there. This is also the location where William Howard Taft resigned from the U.S. Supreme Court in 1930. Ed Grove died at his Battery Park Hotel in Asheville in 1927. His body was sent back to Paris, Tennessee, where his funeral was held, and he was laid to rest at the Paris City Cemetery. His death certificate simply listed his occupation as capitalist. Because of its development of Asheville, he became known as the father of modern Asheville. Luckily, he was not alive to see the hotel fall into a slump after World War II. The only reason the inn was not torn down was because it would have cost too much money. Isn't that a shame? It is. I mean, this was very close to it, but obviously dismantling all of that material, as heavy as it was, they were just like, nah, it cost us too much. Oh, I'm glad that that couldn't happen because it's very, very cool. During World War II, the hotel served as an internment center for diplomats who were associated with the Axis powers. It also served as an Army redistribution center and a rehabilitation facility for Navy men returning from war. In fact, the Philippine government operated in exile on the grounds during the war. In 1955, Dallas businessman Charles Sammons bought the hotel and he restored it. And a little fun fact is his wife, Mrs. Sammons, wanted to bring her dog to the inn with her, Denise, and they were not allowed. So she hid it in a baby carriage. Isn't that funny? Her husband owns the hotel and she's having to sneak the dog in in a baby carriage. But what's even funnier about that is children under 10 weren't allowed. (laughs) (laughs) Great point. Maybe the rules had changed. (laughs) Not not a really good disguise. I'll hide my dog as a child. (laughs) Neither are allowed. Yeah, I'm thinking if they don't want kids seven or eight years old, they don't want a screaming baby. (laughs) That's great. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> I just <laughs> I just now thought of it. But. In 1973, it was named to the National Register of Historic Places. As the inn was restored, two wings were added. In 1998, another massive renovation started, and the $50 million spa was added at that time. In 2012, a $25 million renovation was begun, which updated guest rooms and added the Edison Craft Ales and Kitchen Restaurant. And, of course, that was named for Thomas Edison, one of the guests. Omni Hotels and Resorts bought the hotel in 2013, and they are the current owners. And another little fun fact about the hotel, later in the 20th century, the Supreme Court of the United States even planned to relocate to this very hotel in the event of a nuclear attack. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, maybe because of the rocks, because it's so solid? I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, that's not even underground. And North Carolina is still quite a ways from Washington, D.C. But I just I was like, wow, that's interesting. They just wanted an excuse to go visit an absolutely <laughs> gorgeous inn in the, in the Great Blue Ridge Parkway in the mountains there. Come on, Mr. President, hit the button. Hit the button. <laughs> I need a break. The inn does offer history tours if you ever visit there. Well, that just got added to our little itinerary for 2016. Many historic hotels have more than just long and interesting histories. Many of them house the spirits of lost souls. Do they stay because the hotel holds fond memories for them? For some, is it because they died at the hotel? 
Whatever the case, many hotels claim to have ghosts, and the Grove Park Inn is one of those. The most famous ghost here is not the lady in white, but rather the pink lady. In the 1920s, a young woman staying in room 545 stepped out onto a balcony and somehow fell two stories to the Palm Court atrium floor. When witnesses ran to her body, they found that she had perished and that she was wearing a beautiful pink dress. There have been many eyewitness reports of the pink lady in the history of the hotel. It would seem that she has been seen in various forms as well. One form she takes often is that of a pink mist that is nearly the size of a woman and is seen floating through the hall on the fifth floor or in the lobby. She is also sometimes seen as a full-bodied apparition of a young woman in a pink ball gown. Most who meet the spirit claim that she is a kind spirit. One guest claimed to receive a full embrace from the lady. Another guest claimed that when the lady appeared, she held her hand because the guest had been afraid. I don't know that I would find that comforting if a ghost <laughs> held my hand. Oh, sorry, I scared you. It's okay there, lady. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and then plus her hands probably feel like ice. Uh, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> the hotel staff have become accustomed to her presence. Encounters that staff have experienced with the pink lady include several of them seeing all the lights on the sixth floor turn on and then off. And then the lobby lights did the same. The hotel was closed and locked for the winter when this happened. So there was nobody inside to be doing this. And lots of them saw it at once. Two accounting employees were attending an office party that went into the wee hours of the morning. Around 4 a.m. they claim, quote, We heard someone come in the back door. We looked up and she went by real fast, a woman dressed in party clothes. We thought it was a guest, so we got up to help her. Then she was gone, end quote. The manager of the Grove Park Inn's nightclub, Elaine's, claims to have seen the pink lady several times in the past five years and said, quote, it's like a real dense smoke, a pinkish pastel that just flows, end quote. The pink lady likes children and appears to them more than to adults. This could just be that children are more sensitive. If a child is ill, she is seen speaking softly to them and gently stroking their hands. One guest who was unaware that the pink lady was a spirit at the hotel left a note when he checked out that he would like the staff to thank the woman dressed in pink who had spent time playing with his children. Another guest who was a professor was sitting in the main lobby with his two-year-old son. The child napped and when he woke up, he asked his dad where the nice lady had gone. There had been no lady around them. The ghost of the pink lady is also said to enjoy playing small pranks. She's been blamed for lights, air conditioners, and other electrical devices turning on and off by themselves. She seems to enjoy rearranging objects in the room. It's also been said that she'll occasionally wake up a sleeping guest with a good tickling on the feet. A former police chief claims that he was sitting on his bed making a phone call when he felt someone sit down next to him on the bed. People report cold chills when walking through the hallways, and some researchers who were going to conduct an investigation in room 545 decided against it because of the extreme chill that met them upon entering the room. For those of you who follow the paranormal closely, you probably have heard of paranormal investigator Joshua P. Warren. He dug into the Pink Lady phenomenon because he lived in Asheville and even wrote the book Haunted Asheville. He interviewed 20 people who had experienced some kind of interaction with the Pink Lady. His research began in 1996, and he went back 50 years with his interviews. One of those people was a painter who'd worked for the Inn for 30 years. He said, quote, Back in the late 50s or early 60s, the hotel used to shut down during the winter months, and that's when we caught up on painting. One cloudy, gloomy day back then, I was checking on some of the guy's work. As I got closer to 545, I got cold chills that got worse the closer I came to the door. It got so bad I couldn't work up the courage to go in at all. In fact, to my last day at the hotel, I never did go back there. Sent my boys in instead, end quote. The engineering facilities manager had an experience as well and told Warren, Quote, one day in early 1995, I was on my way to check a recent bathtub resurfacing in room 545. As I approached the room, my hair suddenly lifted from my scalp and stood on end on my arms. Simultaneously, I felt a very uncomfortable cold rush across my whole body. I didn't go in, haven't gone back, and don't ever intend to. End quote. The interesting thing about these encounters is that neither man knew about a connection between room 545 and the Pink Lady, and neither knew of each other's experiences. So this is the painter and the facilities manager. Neither one of them knew of each other's experiences, and they sound very similar. 
it was because of these experiences that they had and some scientific evidence that Joshua P. Warren had gotten. That's how they figured out that this apparition must be connected to room 545. And that's how it became a part of that narrative. And so to me, that lends a little bit more credibility to the story that you've got these individuals that are having these very unique experiences that are similar to each other. With the hotel being in such a beautiful area, it is no wonder that the most famous guest at the Grove Park doesn't want to leave, even in death. Is it possible that a young lady in a beautiful pink dress still walks the hallways here? Is the Grove Park Inn haunted? That is for you to decide. I don't know. The stories about this pink lady, there is a lot of them. Because at first when I was talking to Stephen about this and he had mentioned that basically there's just this one ghost there, I thought, oh, we're not going to have enough material. And then when you start looking at all of the eyewitness accounts, I just grabbed a handful. But there's tons of them out there. Yes, she apparently was a very social lady in pink. The other interesting thing is that we would like to acknowledge the Omni Hotels for embracing their haunted history. Absolutely, because a lot of people don't want you to know, as we know with the stuff that the Stanley's going through right now. Exactly. They, you know, the Stanley's trying to kind of push away their haunted history and don't want a whole lot of uh, ghost hunts going on there anymore. And, you know, bigger hotels generally don't want to talk. You don't. You wouldn't really see a Marriott or a Hyatt or something saying, oh, yeah, we, we've got haunted hotels. Come on down. The Omni is quite different. And interestingly enough, we heard about an Omni when we were in, was it Nashville? I think it was Nashville. There's a haunted hotel there that was an Omni hotel. So I hadn't put two to two, two and two together. But when I was looking at the Omni Hotel's blog, they really embrace this haunted history. They have this whole list of here's all of our haunted hotels. And they even say, if you're a fan of the unusual and unexpected, plan your fall trip with one of our haunted hotels in mind. Especially, you know, when you're looking forward to October. Right. Some of your favorite Omni Hotels and Resorts have long had friendly visits by guests from the other side. Can you imagine? This is a big time hotel resort company. Right. And they are just totally embracing that. So thumbs up to Omni Hotels. Absolutely. Because usually that's more of a bed and breakfast kind of thing or like an old mountain town, you know, an inn or something. I, although this is called the Grove Park Inn. Take a look at it. Um, it's not an inn. <laughs> it's not an inn. It's absolutely gorgeous. And so, and it's by the Omni chain, which they're they are higher level hotels. So it is kind of cool that they're embracing that. And it's not just one of these little bed and breakfast or quaint little places. So that's that's awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing that. It's not too far away from the Biltmore. And as a matter of fact, uh, Grove and the Vanderbilts, they all knew each other. So that's that's interesting little bit there, too. On our next show, we are going to be bringing on one of our new members of our research crew. Kristen Swintek had told us, hey, you know, you guys were talking about you need some haunted locations from South America, down in Mexico, because we hadn't done anything there. Well, the other thing we haven't done in quite a while is a legend show. We used to do quite a few of those, and we haven't done any of those in a while. So we're putting them both together, and we're going to present to you the Legends of Mexico. And we've got a handful of those to bring to you. Very creepy tales. Lots of fun, so we're looking forward to that. And we do have some reviews to share from iTunes. And the first one up is from Squill O, five stars. I love this podcast. I love the cute dynamic between Denise and Diane. I enjoy learning about historically haunted places and the interesting facts that they present on the show. I also like the fact that they appreciate and genuinely seem to care about their listeners. Keep up the great work, ladies. Well, thank you, Squill O, for that. MC Burr, great show, five stars. I am a history teacher, and I really enjoy the fresh approach of this podcast. I'm also a member of the Spooktacular crew. Awesome. Thanks for the feedback and personal touch for the show. Keep it up, ladies. Well, thank you, MC. Look T, entertaining and informative, four stars. As with many others, I came to this podcast via Bizarre States. As a fan of both history and the paranormal, it seemed like a perfect fit, and it is. Diana Denise's obvious affection and relaxed presentation have made them seem like old friends. I look forward to going to St. Augustine for an event and meeting them soon. Well, we'd love to see you, especially on the uh, 23rd. That would be awesome. And Carly Reed Thorne, five stars. Love my two favorite things in one podcast. Nice to listen to while I'm at work or in the car. My friends all think I'm full of random crazy information because of y'all. <laughs> That's awesome, Carly. Thanks so much for tuning in and sharing that information. Thanks to all of you guys for sharing the show. 
We just keep growing and growing. 71,000 downloads last month. It just blows our minds. It's just amazing. And it's all because of our wonderful listeners. Thanks, guys. All right. We want to thank you guys for listening to this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We'd like to welcome new executive producers, Josh and Sarah Kitchen. Thank you. Hey, this is Christopher. And this is Joe. From the Curioso Podcast. And here at the Curioso, when we want to listen to ghost tours for the theater of the mind, we listen to the History Goes Bump Podcast. Societies rise and societies fall. When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle and Whistle Radio, Night Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump. Listen, the M Writing Podcast, Society 13, Rebuilding Society, one podcast at a time.